the equation of a circle centered at the origin and radius r is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. This basically comes from Pythagoras' theorem. If you pick any point x, y on the circle and consider the distance of x, y to the origin, it's fixed, it's constant for any point on the circle. It's a constant r. Well, we have a right angle triangle formed here and the lengths of the two shorter sides are x and y. So by Pythagoras, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Anyway, that's just an aside on the coordinate geometry of a circle. We're interested in getting the area of a circle. So we only need to consider a quarter circle and get the area under this curve here. So the equation of the circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared. We can rearrange that to get y to make y the subject. Because to get the area under the curve, under this curve from 0 to r, this curve is, is a quarter circle. We need to integrate from 0 to r y, it's our function, with respect to x. What this means geometrically, by the way, just as a reminder, if you haven't seen this before, is that we're summing all the tiny little rectangles at each value of x. x is the bottom left corner. x runs from 0 to r. The width of this tiny rectangle is dx. The height of the rectangle is the value of the function at x. Well, that's just y. So the height of this rectangle is y. And in terms of x, y equals r squared minus x squared to the power of a half, or the square root of r squared minus x squared. We just bring the x squared over and get the square root. Now, by the way, we're talking about the positive square root here because the negative square root would actually give us this part of the circle. So we could put a plus sign in front of this just to emphasize that we're getting the positive, positive square root, but it doesn't really matter. So anyway, just to get back to this, the area of one little rectangle is the width of the rectangle dx times the height, which is y. It's just length by breadth, if you like, or height by width, whatever you, you want to call it. We just multiply the two sides together. We multiply dx by the height. Of course, it's not an exact rectangle. There's a bit of a curve on top. But in the limit, as the width gets smaller and smaller, the width becomes dx in the limit. Um, it's an infinity, infinitesimal quantity, and the height is y. And this integral sign just means we're summing. This integral sign is like an elongated s. So we're summing all of these rectangles whose area is given by y times dx from x equals naught to x equals r. Anyway, that's just background. Let's just get on with doing this. We have to integrate from 0 to r of r squared minus x squared to the power of a half. Well, I can just put a square root sign here with respect to x. In order to do this integral, we use the following substitution. We write x equals r sine theta. r is a constant. Theta is the variable. We can write any number x in this form here, whether x is positive or negative, because sine theta is a number between minus 1 and plus 1. No matter what value of theta we have, sine theta is always between these two values. So you see that we can, no matter what value x is, we can al always multiply sine theta by some number r. r is positive and uh, we will get x. So if x was minus 10, we can always find values of r and theta that would give us minus 10. If x was, say, plus 99, we can find values of r and theta that would give us plus 99, and so on. So we can always write x in this form for any real number x. So we can replace x with r sine theta, but we need to replace dx. To do that, we differentiate this with respect to theta. So if we differentiate r sine theta with respect to theta, we get r cos theta. The r is just a constant. We can leave that to one side and then just look at the derivative of sine theta with respect to theta. If you look that up, you will see that it is cos of theta. So to get the x then, we multiply both sides by d theta. So now, what does our integral become? Forget about the limits for now. We replace x with r sine theta. So we have x squared. So we have to square this 
r sine theta times r sine theta is r times r, which is r squared, times sine theta times sine theta, which is sine squared theta. We replace dx with r cos theta d theta. Now we can factorize r squared out of these two terms. If we do that, we have r squared into 1 minus sine squared theta. Then we, we can take the square root sine over both of these, um, both parts of this product. The square root of r squared is r. r, remember, is just a constant. It's fixed. So we can pull that outside the integral sign. Then we have to integrate 1 minus sine squared theta. Now we can use an identity to replace 1 minus sine squared theta with cos squared theta. The identity we use is this one here, cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1 for all theta. So that means that cos squared theta is 1 minus sine squared theta. So we will have the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta to consider here. But the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta is just the square root of cos squared theta. The square root of cos squared theta is cos of theta. So what we have here is cos of theta times the rest of this, which is r cos theta d theta. We have a constant r here, which can be pulled outside the integral sign, so we have r times r is r squared outside, and then we're left with cos theta times cos theta. Well, that's cos squared theta, so we want to integrate cos squared theta with respect to theta. Now, to do this integral, we have to use this identity here. So we have integral of a half into 1 plus cos 2 theta. The half can be taken out, and inside the integral sign, we have 1 plus cos 2 theta with respect to theta. If we integrate 1 with respect to theta, we get theta. Now what do we get if we integrate the cos of 2 theta with respect to theta? Well, if you look up the integral of the cos function, you will see that it is sine. And then what we do is we divide by, by 2. Um, if you want to check this, you could differentiate this. If you differentiate by the function angle rule. There's, there's no power here. The derivative of the sine function is cos, so we get cos 2 theta, but then we multiply by the derivative of the angle. It's the chain rule. The derivative of 2 theta with respect to theta is 2, and 2 times a half gives us the 1 that we require here. So basically when you integrate cos 2 theta, you look up the integral of cos, which is sine, and then you divide by the derivative of 2 theta. The derivative of 2 theta with respect to theta is 2, so we divide by 2, or put a half in front of this. So now we've got the area of a quarter circle of radius r. Um, however, we have it in terms of r and theta, where r and theta and x are connected by this substitution here. So this was our original integral. We had to integrate from x equals naught to x equals r of root r squared minus x squared with respect to x. So what we need to do now is to um, change these limits. So we can apply limits to this expression here. We need limits for this. This runs from x equals naught to x equals r. But of course, this is not given in terms of x, it's given in terms of theta. So to find out what the limits are, we look at each of these limits in turn. Let's start with x equals naught. So if x equals naught, what do we have? We put naught in for x, we have naught equals r sine theta. Or if you like, 0 equals sine theta. We just divide both sides by r r times sine theta is naught, so sine theta must equal naught. r is not naught. r is greater than naught. r is the radius of the circle. It's some positive number. So if sine of theta equals naught, what is theta? Well, in that, if sine theta equals naught, theta is actually naught degrees. Because the sine of naught is naught. So when x is naught, theta is naught. So the lower limit here is theta equals naught. Now let's get the upper limit. The upper limit is x equals r. So what value of theta does this upper limit correspond to? 
So we let x equal r. Okay, so we have x becomes r, so we'll have r equals r sine theta, which means that sine theta equals 1. And if sine theta equals 1, it means that theta is 90 degrees. The sine of 90 degrees is 1. Or if you want to work it out, well, if you're not sure of that, you can just get inverse sine of 1, which is 90 degrees. Now, we want this in radians. Okay, we can't just, we, we're not going to plug 90 degrees here for theta. Um, that won't actually make any sense. In calculus, we're assuming that all angles are in radians. All the results for differentiation and integration only make sense when theta is in radians. So 90 de degrees is pi over 2 radians. So the upper limit here is pi over 2. The next step now is to write this all out again, replacing theta with the upper limit, which is pi over 2. So we have a half r squared into pi over 2 for theta, plus a half sine of 2 times pi over 2. Well, 2 times pi over 2 is pi. Then we put down a minus sign, and we write out all of this, replacing theta with naught. So we'll have a half r squared times naught, plus half times the sine of 2 times naught. Well, the sine of naught is actually naught. So we won't have this term at all. It's just naught. Um, in here, we have to get the sine of pi. Well, the sine of pi is actually 0. It's the same as the sine of 180 degrees. So we have a half of 0, which is 0. So we end up with a half r squared times pi over 2. We can take the, we have a half here, we can take it out. So we get a quarter. So this is the area of quarter of a circle. So this is the area of this shaded region here. So that means the area of a full circle is 4 times this. So we have to multiply this by 4. 4 times a quarter pi r squared is pi r squared. So we get the familiar formula for the area of a circle of radius r.